do you sort of wish that you were still sort of competing so you could take part in a, in a home Olympics? Oh, definitely. That uh, I, uh, I wish I was a, a, probably 10 years younger, I might be able to get, get away with it. Um, but uh, the age of 50, as I will be next year, is a, a dream about making comebacks and being part of a home games. But uh, that realistically, it's not going to happen. But um, of, of the world's best athletes coming to our shores in 26 different sports, uh, I can't think of a better celebration of my 50th year of, of, of watching those athletes compete. And if it was in London in 2004, would you have stayed on? I think I would have done. I would have made me uh, uh, 42. Um, Greg Searle, who is a previous rowing gold medalist, uh, was out of the sport for 10 years. He's actually going to be 40 next year and, and competing after 10 years out. He's back. He's won two silver medals. And you're thinking, hmm, yeah, I wonder if I could have, could have done it. But, uh, yeah, no, I think I would have carried on if it was uh, uh, the Games uh, straight after the one that I did retire at. And how will it be different for the British athletes competing in London as opposed to Beijing or Athens? I think it's been different so far is, is that uh, because when you're staging the Games, there's so much more interest within the country. Um, the government wants the British team to perform well, so actually there's more resources put into the British teams on their build-up towards the Games from, from that point of view. So um, um, that when you're sort of hosted and, um, and uh, uh, awarded the Games, you have something like seven or eight years build-up towards those Games. So Beijing was very much a stepping stone towards London. Very few of our athletes retired after Beijing because they all want to be part of that. But then the home crowd, um, that the majority of, of the stadiums will have more Brits in than, than, than anybody else. And that, uh, that really makes a, a difference from, from the athlete's point of view. Okay, and uh, London 2012, they said this week that they were maybe probably using cleaners and security guards um, as doping spies. I was just uh, wondering your views on that. That's the first I've, I've heard of that. that uh, um, um, anything to, uh, to make sure that if there are cheats out there, they get caught, I'm all in favour of. Um, um, cleaners as spies may be a little bit uh, uh, too much, but um, actually the, uh, some people have been um, uh, of, of caught from um, drug abuse at, at uh, major championships, from the rubbish that has been kicked out of, of, of rooms and stuff like that. Um, I would find it extremely difficult, I'd imagine, that anybody's doing anything in the security of, uh, of, the, of the Olympic Village itself because ex it, security is very tight right the way through and London's going to be no exemption from that. But, uh, yeah, we don't want drug cheats in, in uh, any of our sports, so uh, um, uh, if, if we can uh, uh, try and stamp that out, that would be ideal. And is it possible to have a drugs-free Olympics and is enough being done? I think that, um, that there'll always be people trying to push the, the boundaries back, um, um, that uh, drugs always seem to get uh, a very high issue within that. But I believe actually within uh, elite sport there probably isn't as much cheating going on now as there used to be um, a few generations ago. I think uh, the 50s and, and 60s before there were drug uh, testing is I think there was a lot going on then that, uh, um, uh, that we didn't know about and now that we have very tough uh, testing is it makes it harder um, but there's certainly people that will will try and get around the rules somehow from doing that and um, we have to try and be one step ahead not one step behind okay if I can ask you a bit about business um, the corporate hospitality tickets they don't come cheap do you think the prices are fair um, I think that uh, they are very top end from that point of view um, there hasn't been VIP packages hospitality at the Olympics before and uh, that uh, the proof will be in the pudding, won't it? If people go out there and buy them, then there is a certain market to be able to be looked after the way that Prestige are talking about a, a, of looking after their clients. And certainly the presentation that we just saw uh, was absolutely stunning. That the, the element of details, the uh, pavilion they're putting together, um, I think it is very fitting towards uh, uh, Olympic Games. Um, people might complain of saying, actually, that uh, why is it that the the rich and famous that can afford to go from, from that point of view. But actually what LOCOG have done, have done cheap ticketing for a certain amount, um, five areas of, uh, of different price brackets. There are some free tickets to, uh, to some of the schools within the London area, as well as this uh, um, uh, VIP packaging on it. And I think the IOC will see the way that Prestige are doing it this time around. And I think it will become integral with, with the, the bidding for the Games and it will be part of the whole process. But I don't think that takes away from the Games. I think it actually adds to the Games because obviously what it is is about bringing more revenue in to the host city. 
and uh, that uh, uh, any finance that we can make as a profit has got to be a good thing of, uh, of, of covering the debts that uh, are being run up for the staging of the games. And what sort of effect does um, corporate hospitality have on a sport like rowing? Um, well, they, I've, I've seen the pavilion that they're talking about putting at, at dawn in. It's very, very stunning from that point of view. And actually, they've sold out already with 10 months to go of most of the days at uh, the rowing venue. So uh, I'm really pleased that the sport of mine that doesn't really get very much coverage outside the Olympics is that uh, are being able to, to, to sell um, tickets right at the high end through the, the uh, hospitality packages right the way down to, uh, um, uh, to, to the cheaper tickets as well. We can have 30,000 people uh, at the rowing venue, uh, possibly more if we can find some way of getting uh, uh, maybe another bridge in over, over the river, temporary bridge, and, and from that point of view. Uh, but I think it will make a, a, a stunning venue from that point of view. And it's the volume of people that makes the Olympics so special. I've competed at World Championships where you only get a few hundred people going. To have 27,000 people in, in Sydney as my last games was very, very special. To have 30,000 here in London is going to be amazing. And is that corporate hospitality um, important for the financial health of a sport like rowing? Um, yes, I think it is. Obviously, the, the sport itself is, is not going to benefit from the, the, the corporate packages that are being uh, put on towards London. It's about the, the low cog and, and the, the, the benefits from, from that point of view of the overall budgets. But uh, if rowing can be seen to be doing its bit of bringing the finance in for the, the, the Olympic deficit, if you want to call it in that way, um, that's a, that puts my sport in a, in a much stronger situation. We're always sort of earmarked of a sport that uh, has been a founder sport, always been involved in the Olympics, um, but saying, well, it's a very expensive sport to, to, to run because the Olympic venue isn't chosen on its rowing facilities. So sometimes new builds have to be made from that point of view, and that's not cheap. So if we can justify that uh, selling corporate packages as well as uh, every other tier of ticketing and be sold out, that's saying, well, no, this, this, is, this is financially worth while keeping this sport in the Olympics. Um, Travis, did you get any tickets through the ballots or are you buying hospitality tickets? I put in um, um, a fair amount of uh, tickets for the, uh, um, the ballot and uh, actually ended up with four tickets. So a little bit disappointed myself that I didn't get the, the tickets that, uh, that I wanted from that. Well, what were those for? Um, I've got two tickets for uh, synchronized swimming for my uh, middle daughter and uh, two tickets for my son in, uh, in, in basketball for the first week. Within basketball, you're bidding for tickets that you don't know who's qualified yet. So you don't know who you're actually going to go and see. But he loves basketball and, and to see at that uh, Olympic level will be pretty impressive. Um, we're just a little bit disappointed that we didn't get uh, tickets as a family to go and see some things. But uh, there are still some tickets available in, in January, which we'll be trying for. And uh, so uh, I've got a, a media pass, so I can get into all venues. My wife is the team doctor to the, to the rowing team, so she's catered for for the first day. So it's really the second week we're looking forward to uh, uh, trying to get our hands on some tickets as, as a family to go and see. And how is the British rowing team looking? H how many medals do you think is realistic? The British rowing team is very, very strong indeed, is that we've just had the World Championships uh, three weeks ago. We won 10 medals in Olympic events. There's 14 Olympic events and we medaled in 10 of them. Three gold, three silver, four bronze. And actually came away a little bit disappointed that we, we didn't do better than that. So actually at uh, home water next year, um, I think that we, we possibly could get more than, than 10 medals and, and hopefully some of them uh, uh, a high percentage of bright colors. And finally, what advice would you give them going into a home Olympics um, with the spotlight on them and the pressure? I've never had the opportunity of competing at home games, so I can't really give them the advice of, of what that's going to be like. But uh, they're a very, very experienced team. One of the, the advantages that rowing has is that uh, it's not a whole totally new team each time. So there's, there's a number of athletes that have competed at a number of games. And one of the things that we share is our experiences. So they'll be talking as a, as a group of their experience of, of past games. Um, I will be invited along to, uh, to give my views of the games that I've been to and, and uh, um, what the media are looking from that point of view, what the spectators are looking from that point of view, as well as keeping their focus on what they've got to do is go as fast as they possibly can from 2,000 metres from A to B and hopefully cross that line first. Steve Gregory, thank you very much. Pleasure.